Welcome uh, to Renovating the Rotunda in the Academical Village. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm in the back. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Patrick Stanley. I'm the Director of Digital Engagement in the Office of Engagement uh, and University Advancement. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here today, especially into the dome room of all places. Uh, there's probably no better place to be on grounds. How many times, how many people here, this is your first visit post-renovation? This is your first time back over oh, here. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Post, post the most current renovation. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to name any timelines. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, welcome to everybody, whether it's your first time, whether you're here all the time. Um, I'm incredibly excited that of, of all the uh, opportunities to host uh, one, of these, uh, one of these talks, we get to do it here. Uh, so, obviously, we're here for renovating the rotunda in the Academical Village. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers today. Uh, at the end of, we'll have uh, time for Q&A, so uh, feel free uh, to stick around. We'll definitely have some opportunities uh, to interact and get questions uh, asked uh, throughout the uh, presentation. Uh, but without further ado, let me uh, introduce our fantastic speakers today. Uh, first, we have Mr. Brian Hogg, who's... Moving. Uh, moving behind us, <laughs> uh, the Senior Preservation Planner in the Office of the Architect for the University. Uh, Mr. Hogg shares responsibility for the development and guidelines for the renovation and maintenance of the Academical Village and of the numerous historical facilities studied in the University of Virginia Historic Preservation Framework Plan. Uh, he also has oversight of all historic structures, reports, and capital projects associated with adaptive reuse of historic buildings. He has participated in the renovations of Garrett Hall, New Cabell Hall, and the pavilions 2, 9, and 10. His current projects include the renovations of the Rotunda and the Historic Structure Report for Pavilion 8. He has a BA in Art History and French from the University of Virginia and a Master's in Historic Preservation from Columbia University. Prior to returning to his alma mater, he was a member of the regulatory staff of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission for 17 years, finishing as Director of Preservation. To my left, we also have Mr. Jody Lahendro, Historic Preservation Architect for Facilities Planning and Construction. Uh, Mr. Lahendro has been a Historic Preservation Architect in UVA's Facilities Planning and Construction Department for more than 12 years managing work on the university's more than 100 designated historic buildings, including the Academical Village. Previously, he had his own architectural practice in Richmond for 18 years, specializing in historic preservation, restoration, and adaptive reuse. He has also served as a preservation architect for the Taliesin Preservation Commission, and as it began, it's charged to preserve Frank Lloyd Wright's home in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Ooh, exciting. Uh, Mr. Lahendro received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Virginia Tech and his Master's in Architectural History from here, the University of Virginia. Without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Jody and Brian. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming today. It's, it's nice to be in the rotunda um, on such a beautiful day. I'm happy to be able to talk about this building, which is, of course, the great icon of the institution. It's on every piece of stationery, every business card, every sign. It has been a, an inspiration for people for generations, uh, sometimes more seriously than others. Um, <laughs> you can see how adventurous people have gotten uh, the uh, Etch-a-Sketch and the Lego rotundas and then at the bottom, celebrating the uh, Rotunda Fire in 1965. Some of you may recognize John Herring there in the picture, uh, who was Rand Newcomb Hall for many years. Uh, the most recent, and I think perhaps truest to um, the Rotunda's original intent, was this one, which a lawn resident put in front of their room just this year. It was a little free library. So there were books inside it that people were welcome to take and to read. So it was kind of a nice model and very much in the spirit of, of, of the building. The project that we'll be talking about really began because the roof was leaking. Uh, we had known the roof was leaking for a while, but in 2005, 2006, it became a really serious question. And you just missed it. The, or, you don't, won't see it again for a while, we hope. Uh, the roof was painted annually uh, to hide the rust spots and to keep the water out. It was, it was becoming a real, real problem. Uh, so we began the project 10 years ago, 11 years ago, by commissioning a historic structure report, which is a document that uh, is a record of the building's history and evolution 
as well as a physical investigation of the building to, doc to tell us what condition problems we have and what needs to be addressed. Uh, we went to the Albany, New York architecture firm of John G. Wade Associates to do this, and they would stay with us through the entire project as the designers of the renovation later on. And since we got kind of a nice history of the building, I'll refresh your memories. Uh, this is, of course, Jefferson's drawing of the rotunda. It was made in 1819. Construction didn't really start, though, until 1823. The rotunda was the last building begun at the university. Everything else was finished before construction on the rotunda started. Jefferson was under terrible pressure to open the university at that point. But he stiff-armed the legislature for a few years, telling people that if the library wasn't at least begun, we would never get the money for it, and we would never have it. And the rotunda was essential to his vision for the university, with classrooms on the first two floors and the library in the dome room. And our record of the building's appearance is, is pretty complete, although not always entirely reliable. This drawing from February of 1823 is a beautiful watercolor done by John Nielsen, who was one of the builders uh, at Monticello and at the university. And February 1823 is just when they were beginning to make bricks. So unlike most of Je the Nielsen's other drawings of, these bu of the buildings on the lawn, this one is kind of imaginary. So we trust it for pavilions 9 and 10, which you see on the left and right, which were finished at that point, but, but not so much for the rotunda. It's more aspirational for that. This is an 1844 view of the university from the west. And if you look carefully, you can just pick out a white dome, a white dome uh, in the landscape. And it gives you, gives you a good idea yeah. of um, just how open the grounds were. This view is taken from what's now the Miller Center. There was a toll booth at the driveway of the Miller Center for the highway going east and west um, to Richmond and into the mountains. And so, so you see that we were really almost in the middle of nowhere. And toward the top left of this image uh, is Monticello. That's Monticello Mountain, the, the smaller of the two hills on the left. This is the first photograph of the rotunda from just after the Civil War, around 1868. Uh, the gate at the bottom of the lawn was still present in place. The trees on the lawn had taken a real beating. They were uh, originally black locusts, and the short-lived tree in any event, and, and the neglect and the wear from, from the Civil War uh, left the landscape, as well as the buildings, in pretty rough shape. The first big change to the rotunda was um, in the early 1850s. Uh, I learned recently that on the eve of the Civil War, UVA was the largest state university in the country, with 900, almost 900 students. And Jefferson's original buildings didn't have the capacity to accommodate anything like that. So the university commissioned Robert Mills, a protege of Jefferson's and, and an important architect in his own right, to design a, an addition to the rotunda, which called the Annex, had a large auditorium, and it had modern science classrooms in it. Uh, almost from the day it was finished, it was recognized as a mistake, um, which w was, was too bad, uh, kind of a blot on Mills's reputation, uh, showing, though, that even good architects had bad projects, I guess. Um, and it was there in the Annex that the Rotunda fire started in October of 1827. It was an electrical fire. Uh, it burned south toward the, the drum of the building and destroyed everything. Uh, all that was left after the fire was the brick exterior of Jefferson's structure. Um, the annex was demolished. Cab Olcock and Rouse Halls were built to replace the lost classroom space uh, from the annex's destruction. We hired Stanford White to renovate the rotunda and uh, build Cabblecock and Rouse. And he's gotten kind of a bum rap over the years. Um, people cursed him for generations for closing off the view to the south end, uh, at the south end of the lawn. In fact, that was done at the direction of the Board of Visitors. White advocated for a location to the east of the lawn, um, where the hospital is now, recognizing the importance of that open view. But for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of them 
a pretty explicit racism on the part of the Board of Visitors, blocking the view and blocking access, view to and access from an African American community that was on the south side of JPA. Um, the Board of Visitors directed that the buildings be placed there. So right, excuse me, White was in fact pretty respectful of Jefferson's original designs. He had a chance to examine them in person. Uh, the university took Jefferson's original drawings, folded them up and mailed them to New York and said, this is the best record we have of what was destroyed. So uh, not something that, that would happen today. And White's work on the exterior was really in many ways a very early preservation project. The university requested that he recreate Jefferson's exterior. And he did that with the exception of the dome and, and some other details, the whole north side of the building being one of those. Um, <laughs> he, he was pretty faithful to Jefferson's design, but his charge was to make the rotunda fireproof. After that disaster, there was no stomach for repeating it. So all of the exterior ornament on the building is now copper. It had been wood in Jefferson's time. Uh, the dome, which Jefferson had framed in wood, was replaced with a terracotta dome, a uh, Guastavino vault, uh, again, to make the building more fireproof. Uh, as I mentioned, the North Plaza was added under White's direction. If you look very carefully at this picture, you probably can't see, you'll see that the capitals aren't carved. Uh, the university's budget for the renovation after the fire was incredibly tight. They didn't have money for any landscape, and they didn't have money to have the capitals carved. In fact, it was eight years after the, five years after the project was finished that an alumnus from Richmond cut a check. He was so tired of looking at just blocks of stone at the top of the capitals, uh, and then the capitals were carved later. And we think that perhaps that process of not carving the capitals immediately and properly is what led to their rapid, part of what led to their rapid deterioration. On the interior, White took more liberties, uh, also at the university's direction. And this floor was eliminated in, in White's uh, design. The floor below us was the room that went up to the dome. And you can see in this room now, behind me is a picture of Stanford White's dome room. And on that wall is a pre-fire picture of, of Jefferson's dome room. So you can do a little compare and contrast between the three versions. And that lasted until the early 1970s, which is the renovation that many of you remember. Uh, Beaux-Arts architecture had fallen hugely out of fashion. Architecture has fashion just like everything else. And White's very robust design was dismissed starting in the mid-1950s uh, as vulgar and overwrought. Um, and a campaign began starting in the mid to late 50s to recreate Jefferson's original interior. Finally, with the advent of the American Bicentennial, enough support was created that they could demolish the entire interior of the building. It was taken back to the brick throughout. Um, we have in storage railings. We have, we have a good chunk of that interior in storage marble floor paving, capitals and things, but it, it was removed. And the, and the interior that you all know now was, was recreated. So after all of that work, this is what was left. And this is what we were given to engage. This drawing was prepared by Waite to help us understand the building a little better. What's red is what's left of Jefferson. What's yellow is McKinley and White. What's blue is the 1970s. And what's green is a little recognized, but kind of wonderful project, the WPA project, that put all of the marble balustrades and the marble stairs on the rotunda. And that was designed by a UVA professor with the incredible mouthful of a name, Stanislaus Mikelski, uh, who was on the faculty for many, many years. So that's where we began from a historical standpoint, and, and with the roof, with a condition standpoint. But as we were working along, we realized we had a lot more problems to deal with. Uh, this ninth, the McKinney and White capitals were crumbling. Uh, a piece fell and was found on one of the terraces, and that prompted us to scaffold the porticos and, and do an investigation. And we had a conservator who came and, and looked at them, and he walked around the scaffold and could take his hands and just go like this on an acanthus leaf 
and 10 and 15 pound chunks came off in his hands. And you see some of those lying on the scaffold there to the right, um, which is why the black nets were put up. You'll recall that we had black nets around the capitals for a number of years. And that provoked a question about whether to try to repair these or replace them. And over time, we concluded the thing to do was to replace them and to replace them with the same marble that Jefferson had used, which was quarried in Carrara, Italy. And they were carved in Italy as well. Jeff, one of Jefferson's protégés uh, was the American, had American legate to Leghorn, or Lugano. Um, and he, Jefferson used him as the agent for ordering these things. Jefferson would write a letter, I need capitals, this capital from this plate, and he was mail ordering architectural elements in, in 1820, which is, is kind, of, kind of great. He was asked citing plates in an English version of Palladio, which of course the carvers in Italy had no access or to or knowledge of, but they had been carving these architectural features for generations, so they knew what he was generally asking for. And what we got was close. It wasn't exactly what he wanted, but it was close, enough to satisfy Jefferson. So for reference to recreate the capitals, we have on the left fragments of the Jefferson originals, which are out in front of the University Art Museum. You can go see those. And on the right, this really terrific 1870s photograph, very high resolution, that showed us a lot of detail uh, that's not available in the pieces that we still have. That provoked the creation of a couple of mock-ups, the one on the left is uh, the first mock-up where the bottom was done in stone because we have a pretty intact bottom half of one of the original capitals. And the top was done in clay because we have fragments of an upper half and they had to interpolate details for that. And once we were satisfied with that model, on the right, they made a second, these models were about just over a quarter of each of the capitals. They made a second model in all marble. And that's what's on the right. And then they started carving. And the carving was done by computer-driven carving machines. Uh, about 90% of the carving was done that way. Uh, it took three weeks, going 24-7, for the machine to do the rough out, and another three weeks to finish them by hand. So we have 16 capitals on the building, each with about six weeks' worth of work in them. And the one on the left is the, uh, is the first, well, actually the, the last of the ones that were carved. And in the background is the first one, which the carving studio in Carrara retained as the model for which all the others, couldn't, had, the, all the others had to match. And this is a before and after, the, one of the McKimmy and White capitals and one of the Carrara, the first of the Carrara capitals. And they were arrived, and Jody will tell you how they got to where they are now. Um, but we were very pleased um, with how closely they ended up replicating, um, replicating the Jefferson originals. So, so that's where we ended up on the exterior of the building. But as we engaged the renovation of the building, we recognized that there was a larger problem, which was that the rotunda had become a building that people walked past rather than into. Everybody recognized it, everybody spoke respectfully of it, but nobody came into it. It just wasn't used. The question then was, how can we make it a more integral part of the daily life of the university? So we reprogrammed portions of the building. Uh, the two south wings, which had been offices, including my office, were reused. On the west side, is a multi-purpose room. It's available to anybody in the university community for meetings or lectures or events. On the east side, we put two classrooms into the former office of the architect. that are treated just like every other classroom at the university. Uh, one holds about 20 students, one holds about 30 students. Over the course of last year, there were somewhere between 50 and 60 classes in those two rooms. We also put teaching into the lower west oval room. Uh, and that is used three days a week for classes. Uh, the other two days are more open. The building's hours were extended uh, three days a week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It's open till 10 o'clock for students to come in and study. Uh, their ID lets them swipe into the building so that it's not too busy and strangers aren't wandering in. The I swipe was programmed a little too aggressively initially. President Sullivan said that when 
day last fall, she came down from Cars Hill with her husband to see how things were going in the rotunda, and her ID wouldn't let her in. And, um, a, a, a student took mercy on her and, and, and swiped her in, uh, which, which was kind. Um, we, we repurposed the former museum room into a study space and uh, redid the visitor center. So some of you who were university guys will remember starting tours in the lower East Oval Room. We reorganized that space, um, opened it up, and put a lot more current information in it. One of our great discoveries during the, or we also uh, brought the University of Bell to a more prominent location. Uh, one of our great discoveries during the project was the chemistry hearth. Uh, you remember before there were chemistry ovens below the chair rail, little tiny things. Those were just the fire boxes for this much larger apparatus, which there's extensive correspondence between Professor Emmett and Jefferson and Arthur Brockenbro, the proctor, about the creation. And this classic conversation that still occurs today. Emmett writes to Jefferson, I cannot possibly teach in my pavilion. It's too hot, it's too smelly, I need my own building, and here's a sketch of the building that I need. Jefferson responds, no, you can't have your own building. I'll give you the North Oval Room on the ground floor. Emmett negotiates further. No, it's too hot. There are no windows. Uh, he ends up with both of the Oval Rooms on the ground floor. One is his classroom, and the one is the lab. And so from what we can see, this is the oldest surviving device of this type in the country. And we haven't really found any of this age in Europe. It wasn't the first in America. Big northeastern colleges had things, had standalone buildings for teaching chemistry. But just as today, when chemistry equipment becomes obsolete, it gets discarded, everybody else's was discarded. Ours was bricked up. They stopped teaching chemistry in this room around 1845, put a brick wall in front of it, and forgot about it. And somehow it survived the fire, two renovations, and we were fortunate enough that we drove one of our architects to put his head in the oven and look up. And he saw a void, and we prompted us to knock some holes in the wall, and we, we discovered this. And, uh, on the right is a drawing by Professor Emmett of some of the equipment that he ordered for the university and in his hand, and it was, it was quite a nice record. One of the great changes you may have noticed is that you can come in the front door now. Um, for 40 years, people would walk up to the glass doors and the portico and find a velvet rope and no door handles. And opening those doors up, uh, we did a little pilot in the year before we started the second phase of the renovation. And within three months, two thirds of the people who came into the building came in through that door. It was clearly a demand that existed but wasn't, wasn't acknowledged. Uh, the Board of Visitors room stayed the same. As you walk around the building, you'll see that. Uh, we're hopeful that for the bicentennial this fall, we'll end up with portraits of all seven of the original members of the Board of Visitors hanging in that room for a little while. We're having a little trouble locating one of them who only ever came to one meeting, so um, we'll see. Um, across the hall, though, which what has been the President's reception room, kind of a museum room, we moved out all of the antiques and turned it into a study room that's open any time the building is open and in the evenings when students come. There are comfortable sofas and tables and chairs, and it's been a big hit. It's a very busy place, uh, to my surprise, and I think to others. The sofa and the upholstered chairs don't really get used that much. The students like the tables. Their laptops can go on those and not burn their laps. So lessons learned in how to furnish student study space. The statue of Jefferson is back where it has been for, for 40 plus years. And then we got to this room which is an interesting space. This is the only room that we have any photographs of from before the fire. So it's the best recorded of all of Jefferson's original of interiors. This is where we were starting. Uh, you remember the metal panels in the ceiling that were here for acoustical purposes and were unsightly from the day they were installed and didn't get any better with time. In this case, we were able to go back to a kind of plaster to more closely approximate Jefferson's original intention. We did have photographs of this room from before the fire, and here are a couple of them. In the 70s, they installed capitals in this room that were fiber-reinforced resin, and they didn't have a lot of detail. It was, they were cast, so it was pretty shallow, 
uh, knowing that we would have people on this first balcony after the renovation, which is one of the other changes we made, we wanted to try to have them be both better material and better detailed. But because we had only photographs of the pre-flyer condition, uh, we worked with a studio in Richmond to make clay models that were then scanned. And again, all mostly carved by computer-driven carving machines, finished by hand. Each of these capitals has somewhere between 50 and 60 pieces that were nailed on that were nailed onto a core. And so this is where we ended up uh, with the room redone and with lots of uses. The building is much busier than it used to be, and that's what we wanted. Uh, in the year before we closed, there were about 108,000 people through the building. In the first six months since it reopened, there were 103,000. So we've pretty much doubled the visitation of this building since it reopened, and, and, and that was what we were hoping for. We also worked on the landscape. If the, build, if the goal was to make the interior of the building and more engaged in the daily life. We did the same with the landscape. We worked with Lori Oland from Philadelphia. On the east, uh, the magnolias were removed and what he calls the morning garden was created. It's a quiet, contemplative place with, as they grow, the landscape architects describe fluffy bushes uh, to create a sense of enclosure around a fountain. Uh, which is, is getting a lot of attention. Some of it not intended. Uh, it's a very appealing wading pool. There have been a couple of inflatable rafts and students sunbathing in it already. Pardon me? Not that it's been recorded, but there are definitely... Um, uh, for, better, for better or for worse, at least for the daytime activities, the dean of uh, the vice president for student affairs office is in the north wing adjacent to that courtyard and they have intervened more than once to uh, get students out of the pool uh, the the west courtyard is a harder surface uh, it was we put some doors into the southwest wing so you can reserve both that multi-purpose room and the courtyard and have an event there it was intended to have a fountain Although the budget didn't support it initially, we've recently received gifts that will allow us to move forward with designing and installing that fountain in the West Courtyard. So we're looking forward to that. On the North Plaza, we actually expanded the amount of pavement pretty substantially, but made rooms with the landscape. Uh, careful not to block views of the rotunda from the north side. But we used uh, fringe trees and some other shrubs, native plants, to create these spaces. And here they are this spring, uh, beginning to do what they're supposed to do, which is quite nice. And lastly, on the outside of the building, I just wanted to touch quickly on the archaeology that we did. That's an integral part of any of our projects that involve digging in, around the lawn. Uh, this is an 1858 map of the university showing uh, location of cisterns, and there was a record of a cistern in each of the two courtyards, east and west here. We went looking for it, uh, doing some potholing, using ground penetrating radar, but between the red clay soil of Charlottesville and the magnolia roots, there was no way to um, find anything. We found a few hints and finally decided we had to take the fountain in that courtyard out. And sure enough, they had put the fountain on top of the cistern. And they started digging and digging. It was 12 or 13 feet wide and ultimately 15 or 18 feet deep. It was being done in the middle of one of the snowiest winters that we had in years. And they had tarps stretched over the dig and had to uh, shovel out the dig every morning before they began. And you can see how far they went down. There weren't a lot of artifacts in it. It was deliberately filled. It was, we think it was built around 1851. It was deliberately filled in in 1888 when the first municipal water system in Charlottesville was, was uh, created. Uh, and we didn't think we would need it to fight fires. Um, so seven years later, we recognized that mistake. Um, but what we did find that was really interesting is that the interior of the cistern Somebody went kind of crazy signing his name. Actually, two people did. Uh, one was Charles Carter, and the other was J.W. Brand. 
We haven't figured out who Charles Carter was, but J.W. Brand was the son of a mason who had a contract with UVA to build cisterns. And he was 18 or 19 here, apparently signing, uh, practicing his signatures. It, he later went to MCV. He came to UVA, then went to MCV, became a physician, and uh, ended up in the farther south, I think Arkansas, if I remember correctly. And when news of this discovery was published, his descendants reached out to the university and made contact. So we found out what happened to the family after the cistern was built. But even during construction, we continued to monitor things archaeologically. And this shows um, some of the things that we found, walkways and drains, and all the information that helps us better understand the building. So just as a reminder that everybody has problems, this is from a few years ago when they were working on the Pantheon. Um, I will turn it over to Jody now. Um, so I hope to uh, focus more on the actual construction that went on here. Um, after the historic structure report was completed uh, nine years ago, we had a list that it provided of the kinds of improvements and repairs that were needed at the building. What we didn't have was the $51 million to start that work. Um, so it took several years to raise the money, uh, but yet in the meantime, uh, we had active deterioration going on in the building, and not only that, but it was just damaging the one thing we had from Thomas Jefferson, the brick walls, the exterior, uh, caused by a leaking roof. So we immediately set into then prioritizing that list and then finding about $5 million to do this first phase of work, which was to replace the roof of the rotunda. Starting off that work, we did a probe through the um, steps that were put on in, in the 1976 work uh, to understand more about how, that was how they were constructed, but also this probe taught us or told us that um, we had the lower tension ring of the dome had been, was uh, actively rusting because of all the leakage and it was creating a, a, a structural, or going to be a structural issue. So we knew then what we had to do in terms of the roof replacement and repairing that tension ring. The re roof replacement work started in May of 12, lasted a year, a little over a year, uh, 5.5 million for it. Um, and it, like I said, it took down the bottom two steps, and this is that tension ring that had been severely rusted. Uh, we removed the rust, uh, uh, treated it, protected it, and then rebuilt those two bottom steps. Uh, the roof that was put on in 1976 was the one that was leaking so badly. The McKinley White roof put on in 1898 was doing great, but they took it off uh, for this so they could redo the steps. Um, it was a turn-coated steel, sheet steel roof in 1976, uh, began rusting within 20 years of it being put on. As Brian showed you a picture, they, uh, we would paint it every year just before final exercises to hide the rust. Um, but so our new roof was designed so that it had a breathable, vented uh, backside to the roofing. Uh, that allowed, and then we also used 20-ounce uh, sheet copper for the roofing. Um, and that roof now breathes and um, uh, is, is uh, uh, high, will, will be there for a, a long, long time. Uh, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that there were 4,000 sheets of copper put into that roof. Every one of them uniquely uh, sized for where it had to fit in a circular dome. Um, six tons of copper uh, for that roof. Even before the roof project was finished, we had started design for the second phase. The uh, university had found the money to do the second phase. That second phase was the second and last phase. Um, and it lasted from May of 14 to July of 16, just um, a year ago it was finished. Uh, $53 million for this second phase. 
Uh, and this just shows you the major categories that it covered, exterior repairs, elevator, uh, systems, uh, improved usage, and the landscape. The exterior repairs, most uh, all the wings needed to be repaired. We had spalling brick. Uh, we had damaged marble, uh, 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 distressed marble, and, and stained. The cornices on the main drum of the building needed to be completely redone. We had to strip them of paint, repair them, and then recoat them. Spalling uh, concrete. The building systems were really took up half of the construction costs to replace all the building systems. The systems, the HVAC systems that were put in in 1976 were shoehorned into very small existing spaces. Consequently, they were very rudimentary, single volume, single temperature systems, uh, very inefficient. Uh, the workmen could not even get around them to repair them when they needed to. They had to take the systems apart to get to the places they needed to get. Um, and we had consequently mold growth on the uh, uh, acoustical metal tiles that were in this room. So the architects worked with the university in looking at several different options for how were we going to increase the mechanical space without affecting the views of the rotunda. Uh, and the option we settled on was to create an underground mechanical room in this east courtyard just outside under that wonderful fountain that's there now. Um, we, and then also the lower east oval room, that was taken down a floor also and a mechanical room created underneath that. We then took advantage of all this work in the courtyard by improving how uh, catering serviced uh, uh, events in this space and in all the rotunda. So a tunnel was connected to those major spaces, a small catering room off of the tunnel. That tunnel then was extended over past the rotunda next to Pavilion 2 and a new elevator constructed there. This is also where the catering parking lot is. Catering would co what comes up, goes into the elevator, goes down the tunnel, then puts their uh, dinner tra racks and plugs them in into the, in the uh, catering room. And then when they're needed, rolled out and taken to the elevator that's inside the building. We replaced the elevator inside the building. We took it down another floor to take it to this tunnel. And now we can service anywhere in the rotunda from uh, this catering room and from outside without going down to Cryptoporticus and disturbing everybody there. And this is an artist rendering of that elevator. It looks like a pretty. <laughs> a big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, the building usage, you see some of the things that we focused on for the building usage. Of course, as Brian said, getting classrooms in the building, getting the students back in the building was our, our dearest hope and, and, uh, and objective. Um, and has been uh, very successful. Uh, opening up that South Portico door, uh, the, bath, the restrooms, improving those, the visitor center, uh, in the dome room, taking out that metal acoustical panel ceiling and opening up this lower gallery and uh, enhancing the support services uh, like the catering room. Before we began construction and knowing that we're going to be excavating next under Jefferson's Rotunda and next to it, uh, down 20 to 25 feet. Um, there's risks involved with that. And yet, we, uh, so to, to, to mediate those risks, we put on a building monitoring system because we needed to protect Jefferson's brick walls. We did not want any damage to happen to those brick walls. Um, so we put on four lasers that hit over 130 targets on the rotunda uh, at least once every four minutes and reported back to a website that then um, the consultants with, for that website would provide notifications to the project team if there was a twelfth of an inch of movement. Um, at an eighth of an inch of the movement, we got an alarm. At a quarter of an inch of movement, we shut the project down until we found out what was going wrong. We did have some quarter inch, 
Generally, we found that there was a squirrel dangling off one of the uh, targets, or a workman hit it with their foot, but so nothing alarming. At the end of the project, the eastern side, this side of the building, is 3 sixteenths of an inch lower than the western side, um, which is pretty good considering we have uh, the, the kinds of underpinning that's under there. Well, I'll show you shortly here. 3 sixteenths. Utilities. Uh, the contractor was wise in starting those right at the beginning because we had a heck of a time with utilities. Uh, we were taking all our new utilities towards University Avenue, perpendicular to all the existing utilities serving central grounds that cross left to right in front of uh, the, or on the formerly rear side of the rotunda. Um, and so we, once we got into making the excavations, discovered that the utilities were not where we expected, uh, and that, and these utilities go back to the late 19th century. Um, we ended up redesigning our utilities, taking another eight to 10 months longer than we expected, an uh, extra million dollars uh, in and of cost. We went deeper, we hit rock naturally um, when we went deeper. So it was, a, it was a, 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 a trial for us. Underpinning, so as soon as we got the building in May of 14, after final exercises, underpinning started. And it took from May to December of uh, uh, that year to complete the underpinning. Uh, underpinning, there are 84 shafts that it's done by uh, threading uh, steel beams, temporary steel beams under the wall, and then nothing more sophisticated than a man with a shovel in a hole under that wall, and another guy on top with a bucket and a pulley. Um, and that man just going down, 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 20 to 25 feet. Uh, he would dig that shaft, then we'd pour concrete in it, um, and then go 15 feet away to do the next shaft. 84 of these were done. Once the, the underpinning shafts are done, of course, then the excavations went very quickly. You start to see those shafts, the, the underpinning shafts here underneath Jefferson's brick wall for the drum. Um, excavation started in December of 14. You can see we're getting pretty close to the bottom in, by February. And then starting the construction of the underground vault uh, in March of that year to April, we, we poured the slab for it. Uh, May, we topped it out with a concrete uh, uh, roof, uh, waterproofed it, and then started to uh, construct scaffolding on the top of that. Um, until today, we have this wonderful uh, fountain on top of it. But you see lower left, that's a picture of the mechanical room that's underneath that fountain. Um, this is the tunnel that connects the elevator in the parking area, in the, in the catering parking, to the catering room, and then to the elevator inside the building. And this is the elevator itself. As I showed you, this is the um, artist rendering for it. This is the elevator shaft and the stair that goes and hallway around it. This view is taken from just past the elevator looking towards the rotunda, and the same view today um, shows you that below here is the tunnel going underneath the arcade here and then uh, alongside uh, the, the south side of the east courtyard. Shoring and capitals. So Brian told you about the process of, of carving the capitals. It was a whole another very intense process for how to get the capitals to replace what was already there. Um, it was, uh, we, the engineers came up with a wonderful design, very creative. They designed these shoring towers in between the, the columns that were then jacked up to take the roof of the, the weight of the roof off of the columns. Um, and then they installed a metal track system at the level of just below the capitals within a hoisting tower, well not a hoisting tower, but, but a setting tower, landing tower, just beyond the, and I should have pointed that out, this is the landing tower just beyond the outside of the footprint of the portico roof. 
Um, the capitals were then first removed in a certain sequence and then the new capitals brought in in a sequence. To do that, the engineers designed this special frame cart and uh, hoisting uh, uh, framework that uh, has wheels and hydraulic uh, lifts uh, built into the bottom of the carts. Um, and then uh, at the start, they would put the framework on, use that to hoist them. How much do they weigh? They weigh 6,200 pounds. Um, and then um, you can see the cart here, uh, the, the, the new capital being uh, guided to the, the landing tower. And then this is the, the steel tracks that um, the, you can see them pushing the cart with a capital along those tracks to ultimately the top of the shaft where they're going to be then uh, the jacks in the carts, lowered them on top of the shaft and then uh, 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 fixed in place. The, as Brian said, most people, what most people think on the exterior of the building is painted wood is actually sheet copper that's been painted white because of the BOV's requirement that the building be fireproofed. Um, we had not had experience, uh, the, the preservationist involved in this, with how to uh, repair and restore sheet copper ornament. Uh, we learned a lot. Um, we tried to first, um, as preservationists are want to do, we wanted to just clean the material in place without removing any of it. We tried several different methods. Uh, none of them were satisfactory to us. So we ended up dismantling the, sh the sheet ornament in the seams that originally it was created and taking apart the pop rivets that uh, attach those, se those, those sheets of metal together. Um, take, labeled them, took them apart, took them to a shop in Manassas that stripped the paint off of them and then we met with those uh, repairmen in, in that shop and came up with a level of repair that we uh, all agreed upon. The, uh, the elements were repaired, then primed and painted and brought back and then reassembled on the building. This is a mock-up at that shop of um, the different components of the entire entablature. And this shows you some of the, the, the painted pre modillion block and then what it looked like uh, after the stripping. So the components the metal so the egg and dark at the bottom. And then the curving pieces were added later. I mean on top. Yes. So the way it was co uh, constructed is that first you have this base element here and then these are uh, other pieces that are then soldered to within the uh, uh, recess the um, uh, fluoron was, is a separate piece that was uh, made, uh, and, it, and it's copper that was wrapped around a solid mold um, element and beat and wrapped around it. In fact, this medallion block, were, they often were made of two or three sheets of copper that are melded together uh, around each of those. So the medallion block, the fluoron, the egg and dart, they're all separate elements that are then soldered to a base uh, molded sheet copper. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then putting them back, uh, we found when we uh, started this project that the cast iron um, uh, framework that McKinney and White put on, um, because of the leakage over time, they were installed with uh, uh, lag bolts into wood plugs that were put into drilled holes in the masonry. And those wood plugs had rotted out uh, from all the leakage. And we had found that the armature was actually two to three inches falling away from the building. Um, so we had to dismantle that entire assembly. Uh, we uh, uh, sandblasted the cast iron, recoated it with uh, a rust inhibitor, and then use stainless steel angles that are hilti bolted in, with epoxy um, into the walls uh, so they'll never move again. Um, and then the, you can see how the sheet copper is in attached to it. Yes, the, yes, they're still there. <laughs> um, 
the, co the clocks were, were a wonderful uh, uh, surprise in themselves. Um, our conservator, Mark Cutney, uh, and these are, of course, the McKinney and White co clocks. How many? Okay. McKinney and White clocks. Um, and our conservator found that once he was able to get up there and study the paint, that they'd been painted over several times. That originally they were gold leafed, or not gold painted, um, and that there were, you can see in the clock that was there, there's no minute indications. The originals had these minute indications. Um, and they were gold because that was typical for the time and that it reflected the sky above as you were looking up at the clock and they, they stood out more. We've restored all that. They are now, they have the appearance that they did with McKinney and White. So the South Portico from June of 15, two years ago, um, you can see we've we put the new capitals in, but we put boxes around to protect them. Um, at $50,000 a piece, we didn't want a ha uh, carpenter's hammer to fall on one of them. Um, and the, you can see that all the sheet metal uh, ornament has been taken off and is, is at the shop being stripped. We're stripping the paint off the shafts of the columns. And then a year later, um, all reassembled and, and, the, uh, and opened. Um, the North Portico went through a similar kind of um, evolution. Um, uh, June of 15, uh, finishing up utilities, uh, the steps on the North Portico, the marble steps were all taken apart, taken apart. They were numbered, taken off, because underneath of those steps on the North Portico, there are rooms. And the concrete superstructure put in by McKinney and White was badly deteriorating. Water had gotten in there, was rusting the rebar, the rebar was expanding, and the concrete was uh, exploding. Um, so we took off the, the marble steps and risers, um, replaced the concrete superstructure, waterproofed it, and then brought back all those uh, marble steps and, and reassembled them. Um, so you get the uh, one year apart, uh, June of 15 to, to last year, with the, the new uh, landscape and completed. Uh, the West Wings, uh, once again, the West Wings leaked uh, badly. They uh, were damaging, did damage the concrete uh, uh, floor beneath them, which is also then the, the ceiling for the offices and the wings. Uh, we stripped off all of the paving, re, uh, applied the waterproofing again, and then put back the paving. We also took this opportunity to repair the marble balustrades that, as Brian told you, were put in in, in late 1930s by Mikilski, um, and cleaned them and repointed. Uh, other exterior work included such things as conserving the uh, plaster eagle that's at the underside of this south portico that dates from McKinney and White's work. Um, and we felt like it was important to, to save that. We ended up having to re, uh, take away all of the ceiling in that south portico, but we left that eagle in the center and then uh, incorporated it into the new ceiling. When we took the ceiling away, of course, we had to destroy the uh, moldings. They were plaster moldings. We brought back craftsmen and who knew how to do the running plaster moldings, um, and they restored those. Um, the, the north steps, pouring those, and then cleaning. We uh, stripped all the paint off of the colonnades uh, and the cryptoporticus so that we can get the um, latex paint off and go back with the lime paint that allows it, those, those surfaces to breathe. And thus, you're not trapping moisture between or behind the uh, latex. Uh, so you can see a before and after. Um, this is of the uh, east colonnade. The, the wings themselves, south wings, uh, you can see befores and afters. Uh, this is the south, uh, uh, southeast, one of the classrooms in the southeast, and this is the southwest wing, the new multi-purpose room that Brian talked about, and this is what it looked like uh, previously. The first floor center hall um, started off like this. It had the same kind of stair as you go up as here, going from this 
dome room floor to the piano noble, the main floor. We felt like that that was an inappropriate set of stairs for going from a very utilitarian chemistry lab smelly space to the uh, main level. We ended up taking those out and putting back straight steps, stairs. Um, this shows the, the, the sequence from what it looked like before, uh, taking them out. Here you see the scars, filling in those spaces, putting, rebuilding the new stairs. This gives you an idea of the kind of infrastructure that is in the ceilings everywhere. Um, it's filled, it's packed with uh, uh, sprinkler systems, new electrical systems, uh, wireless access points, cellular phone antennas, um, fire alarm detection systems, um, all kinds of things, new lighting, electrical, um, as, and today, how it turned out. Also doing this allowed us to then create on the under, back side of the stairs, you'll see going through the building, a new entrance to the elevator. Before, with the elevator in this building, you had to go up, you had to have a guide take you up to the Cryptoporticus, go through an outside door that was locked, and take you personally up the elevator to the floor you wanted to go. Now, anybody can get to the elevator at every fl any floor. Uh, it's completely accessible. Uh, the oval rooms, typically, um, we stripped out all the ceilings so that we can put all those new systems in and we uh, had put in acoustical plaster ceilings, uh, and you can see some of the afters. This is the lower east west oval room that is now one of our three classrooms, and it has all the modern technology. It has uh, screens that uh, retract uh, into the ceiling. It also has a projector system that retracts into the ceiling, AV systems, um, uh, lighting scenes, different lighting scenes, all of which can be controlled by a monitor, uh, remote monitor, that's at the lectern. Was this brick form in the beginning? Yeah, well, it was put in 1976, yes. This is the room that has a new mechanical uh, space below it, so all that was taken out and we put the brick floor black, back. Um, the second floor oval rooms, um, the Board of Visitors room, uh, looks pretty much the same as it did beforehand, but now with all new technology. Uh, one of which that I should mention are these carts. Um, how do you introduce new monitors uh, for PowerPoint presentations into a building like this? Um, and our designers came up with this idea. These are all mobile carts. Um, these, the monitors actually pivot 90 degrees and they can be rolled into, so that they can be rolled into the elevator and taken to any floor in the building. And then we have plug-ins uh, in every, every room where you can plug these things in and then have somebody with a monitor or a comp laptop computer control them from one central location. Um, the dome room ceiling here, this was uh, a, an, an incredible marvel to watch. Um, it's an acoustical plaster ceiling. I told you about the one that was here, the, the metal, perforated metal panels that were removed. Um, this system has acoustical boards that are first put in, and then two layers of 1 16th inch thick plaster. Um, our plaster crew practiced for a week how to do this because they could not stop. We could not have cold joints. You had to do one quadrant at a time, at one time. Um, and there are five different activities going on in this picture here. They're all doing something different, and there are 15 of them. Um, and like I said, they practiced for a week, and to be there that day, that first day, and watch them do this was just a marvel. Um, it turned out beautifully. Yes. And they, we had to get special dispensation for them not to wear hard hats. Um, the, the building officials had to let us have them just wear their do-rags because we didn't want hard hats impressions in our plaster ceiling. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, that's one of the reasons, yes. But we were told that we needed to have expansion joints uh, also. So if we had to have them, um, we figured this was the best arrangement for them. Um, and I think I'm about finished, let me see. So you can see the, the before and after um, of this room. 
uh, dome room gallery. Uh, this stair was put in. Uh, as Brian said, this is the first time since 1976 that this gallery has been opened. Uh, it's, as an architect, it's absolutely amazing how much in, uh, how much activity it adds to the space or how much it, it engages you, that there's, there's something going on above and below at the same time. It's really wonderful. Um, and it gets used a lot. The students love it here. Uh, great people uh, that worked on the project. It was a team effort. Wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, the highlight of my career, clearly, uh, and not just because of the building, but because of the, how we work together. Thank you. If you wait for the microphone, if the you Oculus. wait for the microphone since it's being recorded. Okay, so the uh, question about the Oculus, that was part of the first phase of work. Um, it is based upon a extant example from uh, Latrobe's da uh, Daveridge Hall in Baltimore, um, and uh, so the mold the moldings and the and the and the, uh, the mullions are based upon that design. The glass you'll see an etched ring periodically in it. That's to mimic the way skylights were built at the time, which was to layer glass, they didn't have those kinds of long sheets of glass, so to layer glass almost like shingles, and there'd be about a, a, an eighth of an inch separation so you didn't get capillary action to bring water up. And so we, we decided to, to put in these etched uh, rings to mimic that kind of effect because their dirt would have built up in, the, in those places. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm uh, gonna make, I'll, I'll make Althea mad if I don't talk to him first. A friend of mine who's a historian in Norfolk knew that I was coming up here for reunions. I'm sorry. I'm, a friend of mine in Norfolk, Virginia, who is a historian for the city down there, knew that I was coming here for the reunions, and he sent to me in the mail an article that appeared in the 1910 Norfolk paper about the monument out here for, for uh, Jefferson, okay? I don't see anything here in walking around today that tells you about that one, which is tied to Homer at the end. Moses Ezekiel, which was a VMI cadet, did that yes. in there. And I feel like those two are so important here at the university, we need to have something to recognize what he did here. Yes, we do, Brian. <laughs> um, I'm turning to the office of the architect to, uh, to initiate this. <laughs> Yes, um, there are a lot of things that need some interpretation here, and we work on it. We're working on we work on these things incrementally. But that's that's a good point that we should uh, we'll certainly take. Moses Jacob Ezekiel was a very important sculptor in Virginia. He fought at the Battle of Newmarket, uh, uh, held one of the ten who died in his arms as he passed. Um, uh, then went on to become a sculptor, went to Italy, and has his, uh, had his studio there in Italy. Yes. I I'm realize, sorry. Althea is controlling things. I realize, so there, I realize there are a lot of uncertainties in historic preservation. How on earth did you bring this project in for, what, $53 million in two years? Uh, no. Well, in three years of actual construction. I guess my question is, how do you possibly plan budget-wise and time-wise for you, a project of this incredible scope? As you can see, we, we failed miserably because we started off with $50.64 million at the end of the historic structure report nine, ten years ago um, and ended up costing $58.5 million. So we missed it. We, we, yeah. Jody mentioned the funding, and it is important to acknowledge that the Commonwealth put up half of that funding, and the other half was... We're not hearing it. Uh, is it on? Uh, the, the Commonwealth put up half of the money for the, uh, for the project, and don donors put up the other half. No money came from student fees. Okay. What projects are coming up next on the lawn? Well, we're still paying for this one, um, but uh, we are making repairs to Old Cabell Hall at the end of the, of the lawn. We're putting about $5 million into that building to replace major plumbing and, and electrical distribution system. We just found out, uh, I wish you could speak, but... It, we're, the, the next of the Jefferson buildings will be Pavilion 8, 
which was last worked on in um, 1983. Uh, it's got classrooms on the main floor and two apartments in it. And we're, we hope about uh, next January to start construction on a renovation of that that'll um, update it. So much of the damage was water. Is after a new roof or a new surface like the, the plaza or whatever is done, is there, is there a test where you, know, you drop some paint or water and follow it and see where it goes and see if it's supposed to go there? I mean, shouldn't that there, be part of the process? Is there a test to, to do yeah. what? I'm, to, I think that should be part of the process. Well, there, I mean, the, the systems are all tested, yes. But yeah, um, we do. Because, but because we're a state agency, we're obligated to manage the stormwater much more aggressively than a private developer is. So that whole North Plaza is paved with pervious pavement. It goes through and is collected and then managed on its way down the stream. So it's... Um, it's very carefully designed, uh, the way that the water goes out. And the same with, the, well, the roof water goes into underground drains, and technically our watersheds are compromised. So we're obliged to manage the storm water very carefully, and the designs for this renovation took that obligation into account. Ironically, with the roof before that we replaced, it actually rusted from the underside out because of the condensation coming up from the building itself, migrating through the masonry and then condensing on the underside of that metal. So it actually rusted from the inside out. That was one of the reasons why we put that ventilated system uh, under the, uh, the copper roof. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, they're all sloped to go to drains. Okay. I have another question to ask you. Did you have to bring in any experts from the outside to help you on this job? And the second question, did you have any serious accidents during this reconstruction? Um, yes, lots of experts. Like, like I said, it's a team effort. So we look to our uh, architect and engineers to, um, to recommend experts that they wanted to bring in. For instance, uh, Gail. Um, right. Yes, uh, an expert from the University of Texas uh, consulted the architects on how to best clean the marble uh, balustrades uh, all around the building. Um, and, and the contractor did an amazing job of finding skilled subcontractors to do the very specialized work, the masonry repairs and some of the woodwork and the stone carving and wood carving. So. It, it, it was, it, there were outside experts brought in both during the design and the execution. We had archaeologists involved, uh, outside archaeologists, uh, Ravenna Archaeological Services, um, and uh, coatings experts for when we painted the, the roof. It's a floor upon uh, 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 epoxy coating system that is guaranteed to last at least 20, 25 years. <laughs> we think it'll last longer, hopefully. It's all um, body paint. So, lots of experts. Yes. Um, about 12 or 15 years ago, I had a conversation with John Castine when the, the Commonwealth support of the university was shrinking rapidly, heading towards zero. I said, why don't you just privatize the university? He pointed out the minor detail that the university owns all the, I mean, the, the Commonwealth owns all the buildings. Who owns the rotunda? The, the Rotunda was constructed by the Commonwealth originally. It, the entire original university was a state-funded project. This building has been owned by the Commonwealth of Virginia since the day the first brick was laid. That's why they contributed half of the projected cost? W well, we, yeah, we felt very happy. Uh, it took a lot of, <laughs> no, no, honestly, no, the, 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 it took a lot of lobbying by the president to get the legislature to help fund this. This is not a typical building, right? It's not a classroom building or lab building. President Sullivan walked around in Richmond with bags of crumbled marble and waved it at the legislators as she testified in budget hearings to try to help them understand why we needed their support. And then that was what helped our, our advancement and development folks 
be able to leverage the private gifts that completed the project. So it was, it was very important that there be this combination that we could go to the state and say, we're, we're stepping up on this part of it. And then there was trust from the donors that the Commonwealth was participating also. So it was a very, uh, it was a, quite an elegant solution. Question here. Along with that, since it is a world UNESCO site, did you receive any assistance in expertise or aid, or did you have to follow any regulations because of that? For these purposes, the UNESCO listing is more of an honorific. We did work with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, to whom the National Park Service has delegated its authority. So they, we worked with that outside state agency in review uh, of the proposed work, but the, the design and execution was all by the university. We have one final question. How much of this room is from 1976? Uh, well, the floor, <laughs> the columns, the walls, the windows, the balustrade, uh, the capitals are new. The railing, interestingly, is from 1976, the gray metal railing, because if we had changed it, it would have had to be 10 inches higher than it is now. Um, so I would say, what, 75 or 80 percent, yeah. not least. including the ceiling, is from, is from 76. As I mentioned, this was the one room that was really well documented from before the fire or had some documentation. So of all of the spaces in the building, this was the one that uh, Freddie Nichols and Baloo and Justice were able to most carefully recreate. Yes, sir. Like the floor, can you comment on, on the floor? It's, um, it's, it's heart pine, reclaimed heart pine. This, this is the wood that we see used throughout the original buildings, both, from, both as floors and as structure. It was the go-to wood around here for building purposes. So um, this was one of the really early uses of that reclaimed material. It was quite celebrated when the building reopened. Uh, and now it's, it's more available on the market than it was then. Awesome. <laughs> Utilities. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for your attendance.